on this thing called Why Should I Worry or Fret? I want to give you some information, biblical information, as we were beginning to go into this pandemic. But here we are, six months later, still without a whole lot of relief, and I thought maybe we need to be reminded, why should I worry or fret? And today's scriptures would be taken from James chapter 1, <laughs> verses 2 through 12. You can listen as I share God's word with you. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your for let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He'll not rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Did I hear an amen to that? Amen. We need to be sure that it's God that we're placing our trust in. Do not waver. For a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from their Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world. My friends, you can't have one foot in heaven and one foot in the world and expect God to respond. This world is telling you a host of things that are unbiblical, that are anti-Christ. You need to be sure that you allow the Holy Spirit to sift all that out. You're unstable in everything they do. Believers who are poor have something to boast about, for God has honored them. And those who are rich should boast that God has humbled them. They will fade away like a little flower in the field. The hot sun rises and the grass withers. The little flower droops and falls and its beauty fades away. In the same way, the rich will fade away with all of their achievements. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they'll receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And that's why we played that song for pre-worship, Almost Home. That's the crown of life that's offered to us when we endure what we endure here below. Well, as we get started, I'm going to just share a little clip from a, a peanut cartoon. Lisa, or Lucy, you know who Lucy is, she offers one of her unsolicited observation about life. She says to Charlie Brown, life is like a deck chair. Some place it where they can see where they're going. Others place it where they can see where they have been. And then there's those that place it where they enjoy the present. Charlie Brown says, I don't quite understand all this. I can't even get mine unfolded. <laughs> have you ever been there before? <laughs> it's not so much where you're going, where you've been, or where you're at. You just can't get that life thing all together. You know, in a 2003 edition of Reader's Digest, there was an advertisement for an antidepressant. And its slogan went like this. Depressed mood? Loss of interest? Sleep problems? Difficulty concentrating? Agitation? Restlessness? Hmm. Speaking to anybody here today? <laughs> then it concluded with these words. Life is too precious to let another day go by feeling not quite yourself. If you experience some of these symptoms nearly every day, or for at least the last two weeks, a chemical imbalance could be the blame. And life can be difficult and feel difficult all day. Wow. Some of us are saying, hmm, maybe I have a chemical imbalance. Well, you know, when you read this particular advertisement, you think that all suffering and all depression and all the things that we ever experience that are negative can be summed up under this umbrella, a chemical imbalance. And it is true. Don't mistake what I'm saying. There are times when you do need to go to a doctor, have an evaluation to see what's going on. But oftentimes, it's just the fact we live here below. It's life. Life happens. And so I pray that as we're going through life, that God can give us some reinforcements to help us endure with patience. You know, trouble and difficulty come to everybody. I know you've not been exempt, and guess what? Your pastor hasn't been exempt. 
Sickness, suffering, disease, even death, afflict both the rich and the poor. Job suffered deeply, and he cried, Man is born to trouble, from Job 5, 7. The psalmist said, You have made me see troubles, many and bitter, from Psalm 71, verse 20. I think any pastor that might be listening to this message online would agree with me that we as pastors have seen people going through various times of trouble and difficulty. I once sat with a mother and her daughter, sat for hours as I watched her daughter die because of AIDS. I've been at the bedside of numerous church members or their extended families they slipped from this life into eternity, some due to cancer, others an illness or a sickness that they could not recover from, some from a terrible tragedy. So my eyes have seen some things, and I have to agree with the songwriter. There are troubles, many, and some can be extremely bitter. Chapter 1 of James deals with the practical problem of difficulties and troubles. Problems abound all around us. And many times we're going through that particular valley, we ask, why me? Why this? Why now? And James challenges us with this amazing admonition. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whatever you face, the trials that you come upon, consider it pure joy. Wow, how do we do that? Well, let's kind of flesh out our scripture for the morning. What we need to know is that troubles do abound. They do. You, you can't escape that. They are inevitable. James says whenever you face trials, he didn't say if or you might. He says whenever. They're going to come when they come. In other words, troubles are not an elective. You can't opt out of them. You can't simply say, I just want the roses. I don't want the thorns. They're a part of the core curriculum of life. And it says there's trials of many kinds. James actually uses a word that means multicolored. And the reason for that is because of their intensity and also their variety. They may involve pain of a lingering illness or maybe an untimely death. Some know the heartache of a broken marriage or a short-circuited relationship. Trouble may come from a rebellious child or an alcoholic loved one. Some struggle with problems in business, others in health. Others combat lingering depression or maybe there's a habit that they just can't seem to break. It's like a chain that binds them. Our troubles are many covered indeed. But troubles are also purposeful. Let me say this. They're purposeful when we've done nothing to bring them on ourselves. Now, there's times we endure troubles <coughs> because we deserve them by our own actions, by our own behavior. But if they're just troubles that are coming with life, they do serve a purpose. We don't always understand the purpose, and especially while we're in the midst of the trouble itself, in the midst of that pain, but in times of trouble, don't ever believe that God has abandoned you. That's the first and foremost thought that the enemy wants to bring to your mind, that God's no longer with you. But James says that Actually, trials are the evidence that God is at work in your life. And even the Apostle Paul agreed, and I don't know of any of us that have gone through the trials that he went through, but he says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. 2 Corinthians 4.17 Trouble, if we allow it to, can work for us rather than work against us. In fact, the specific purpose is that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Hmm. You know, the Greek word literally means to remain 
under. The ability to remain under pressure without collapsing. To cope successfully with the strain of stress. Such perseverance requires time, doesn't it? And it requires one that you are anchored to because you can't do it in your own power or through your own resources. Also, such troubles give us the ability to recognize our need for God to speak into our lives. So don't interfere with God's plan for your life. I would say hang in there so that his plan for you can be completed. Remember, you may just see the back of the tapestry with all the threads going every which way when God's working on the beauty on the other side. So, even though troubles are hard, and sometimes they're difficult, and sometimes we sense that God's fingers are squeezing to mold and shape us, and they hurt, it's still part of God's plan in making you the person he desires for you to be. Our goal as growing Christians, and I hope you'll, you'll take note of this, somewhere kind of inscribe it in your heart. It's not for us to be happy, but to be holy. He wants us to be holy people. He wants us to be spiritually mature. We don't seek trouble. I don't know any one of you that go out and purposely look for trouble. If you do, you're a rare breed, to say the least. But we can rejoice in our troubles because their dividends are greater than the discomforts that they bring. God is far more devoted to our character than to our comfort. We will eventually leave behind everything we have, but not our character. Our character is that which is going to oppress people around us, and that which God is trying to build within us. Warren Wearsby says this, Our values determine our evaluations. If we value comfort more than character, then trials will upset us. If we value the material and physical more than the spiritual, we'll not be able to count it all joy. And if we live only for the present and forget the future, then trials will make us bitter, not better. So understand, trials are going to come. You're not exempt from that. Secondly, what we need to do about our troubles. Now, I was going to play a song for you this morning. Most of you are going to know it when I begin to share the lyrics. I could not get a good video to, place to play the song. But here's the words to the song, and then just kind of nod your head if you recognize the words. Here's a little song I wrote. You might want to sing it note for note. Don't worry, be happy. In every life we have some trouble, but when you worry, you make it double. Don't worry, be happy. Don't worry, be happy now. You ain't got no place to lay your head. Somebody came and took your bed. Don't worry, be happy. The landlord says the rent is late. He may have to litigate. Don't worry, be happy. How many know that song? In fact, you're probably already singing it in your head right now as I was sharing the lyrics. I wanted to place that song before you because, you know, it kind of puts a smile on our face when we hear it, right? No matter what we're going through, it's like, yeah, Lord, you got this. I don't need to worry be happy. But let me just say this. James doesn't offer a mindless exhortation to just grin and bear. That's not what he's saying. Nor does he call for stoic reservation. I'm going to get through this no matter what. Actually, James gives us four suggestions for dealing successfully with the troubles that we face, even this long period of the pandemic that we're going through. One, no matter what you're facing, it's going to be difficult, live joyously. I think I put this in your notes. Life is difficult. Suffering is inevitable, but misery is an option. You can choose whether you're going to go ahead and endure with perseverance, or if you're going to be bitter, if you're going to be miserable. You know, I came across a very interesting story. It came out a number of years ago, but it's been on social media, so you probably already know the story. 
There were two men that were very seriously ill. They were placed in the same room in a hospital. Now, one of the men, as part of his treatment, was able to sit up for a while, and he was placed by a window so he could see out the window. The other guy, because of the nature of his illness, was propped up a bit, but there was nothing for him to look at. The one by the window, when he was able to sit up for that period of time, would look out the window and begin to tell the other man everything he was seeing. Now, when they were both kind of lying down, they talked about everything under the sun, about their families, about their war experiences, but they really didn't have TV to watch, there was no radio in the room, so they had to keep each other company. What was amazing, though, is a man looked out the window, in great detail he described everything. Apparently, he looked out over a park, and he said, the lake has ducks on it, at times there's swans. He said, oh, the children would throw bread and sail their model, you know, boats on the lake. Young lovers walked hand in hand beneath the trees, and there were flowers and just stretches of grass. Sometimes there were games of softball. And he said, right at the back, there was a tree line, and beyond the tree line, you could see the city skyline. And he just every day explained what was going on in the park. And the other man enjoyed listening as this was being explained to him. He talked about everything happening each day. But then all of a sudden, one afternoon, the man who could not sit fully up became very discontent. Why does he get the window then? Why does he get the privilege of seeing everything out the window? And he got bitter. Well, one night, during the night, the man by the window all of a sudden had an issue. He couldn't breathe. He was choking. He couldn't even reach his button to get the nurse for help. The other man did nothing. He could have hit the button to bring the nurse into the room, but he did absolutely nothing. When the nurse came in the next morning, they discovered that that man had passed away. Well, when things seemed to settle down, the man now that was in his own bed, away from the window, asked if he could be placed now at the window bed. No problem. They put him over there. And when he was moved, made comfortable, and left alone to be quiet, with every bit of his strength, he perked himself up so he could see out the window. He got up, he looked out the window, and all this moved across to the brick wall of the hospital on the other side. There's really nothing there. The first man tried to make it come alive to help his partner. He expressed joy in the middle of his own suffering, not for himself, but to help his partner. The story concludes with this. Some people may always face a blank wall, and yet they know how to bring beauty and joy in the midst of their pain that is enriching to everyone around them. As a result, they make life come alive for those that are about them. They cultivate a joyful attitude. <coughs> what I God want you and I to do in the midst of our pain, to still exuberate the joy of the Lord. And then we're supposed to live expectantly. James uses wisdom in the Old Testament sense of the word. Wisdom is truth that is actually acted upon. Knowledge applied practically. The ability to live life successfully in the midst of difficult situations. Like I shared in our opening prayer, it can always be well with our soul because God makes it well, even though when it's not well with our circumstances. It acknowledges God, and it's giving our ability to understand that God is in control, not you and I. In verse 5, when James says that God gives generously, the Greek word translated generously actually means he gives simply or straightforward, indicating that God gives with a single-minded, unhesitating concern for us. He yearns to give you and I wisdom in the midst of our trials. You know why? Because as we're going through trials, a lot of times the enemy can get us to make wrong choices. If God gives us wisdom, we will make proper choices, pure choices, and we're going to live with the expectancy of the benefits and the promises that God brings. And then live submissively. 
The double-minded person halts between two options. It's really a double-souled person. With one soul declaring, I believe, as the other soul shouts out, no, I don't. It's kind of complicated, isn't it? One foot in heaven, one foot on earth. And you're caught in the twits of both of them. That's what makes that kind of person unstable. Indecisive makes it ineffective in every aspect of his life. Every shifting wind of doctrine influences him. In fact, I probably need to encourage you to read Galatians chapter 2, because the Apostle Paul talks about false doctrine, a different gospel, and so often we allow these kind of things to penetrate our thoughts when the Holy Spirit says, no, that's not of God. But if you have that unstable, shifting mind, you're not going to be able to distinguish between the two. Each storm of opposition threatens our loyalty to God. This is if we're unstable. Without an unwavering confidence in God, adversity creates doubt rather than submission. To James, faith is a commitment to the will of God. You may have heard about the mountain climber who slipped and fell. Sad thing is, he was climbing alone. He grabbed a vine. And here he is, he's hanging above the cliff, and below is the ravine. He doesn't know what to do. So he begins to bargain with God, saying all the things he's going to do if God will get him out of this predicament. And he literally hears a voice from heaven saying, then let go. And he goes, oh. <laughs> God, did you hear my prayer? I'll do anything for you. And the voice came again. Let God, let go. And finally says, is there anybody else out there I can talk to? <laughs> and I think that's how you and I are. When God said, just let go of it, it's like, I don't know. I need another opinion. I need another option. <clears throat> then we need to live humbly. Life is so uncertain that tragedy and despair may strike at any time. It is foolish to trust in anything that may be lost in a moment. It's only wise to trust in things that truly are eternal. One commentator made this insightful comment about James chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. He says, James chose to illustrate this theme by reference to poverty and wealth. He could equally have chosen any of life's contracts, loneliness and companionship, long married life, in unexpected bereavement. Those that are endlessly very testings, which makes the colors in the tapestry of each life so different. Family life, childlessness, marriage, and singleness, health, and illness. There is no end to the list to be made and the contrast to be drawn. Life is like that. The wisdom God gives makes us see earth in the light of heaven. Life in the light of eternity. The flickering pattern of experience in the light of the steady reality of salvation. And wisdom is sought from God in the place of prayer. I like that. As we wrap up this morning, understand that trials are revealed a Christian must face with steadfast courage. Such things as illness, pandemics, unpopularity, financial loss, sorrow, or even persecution. They're all ordeals, but you need to face them with courage, steadfast courage. Those who persevere are approved. In other words, they have stood the test. And the words that James uses for stood the test, those are the words that would appear on pottery tested in fire and found approved. It's almost that, I don't know if I should use this, was like the good housekeeping seal of approval that you would find. If a pot cracked under this kind of pressure, it would be disapproved. And that's another Greek word that is used. You and I do not want to be disapproved because we're constantly cracking under pressure. God's approval produces real happiness and real blessings. It is the word for genuine joy. There's more than just a superficial joy. It's an inner quality that endures even in the times of trouble. The crown of life, that's how it ends, isn't it? 
Ah, the crown of life, that is something that we await for. But it's something that you might enjoy now. You know why? Jesus himself said, I came that they might have life. Capital L, life. More abundant life from John 10, 10. Let's come before him in prayer. Father, thank you so much for these moments together. And I hope they have helped us understand that you do have a recipe for our times of trouble. That you do have a means in which we can persevere. In fact, in which we can count it all joy. Not happiness. It won't bring happiness. But there can still be that inward peace. It can be well with our soul because of who you are and your grace and mercy. Now as we go our way, Lord, I pray that you will give us the courage to be steadfast in all that we face until we meet again. In Christ we pray. Amen. God bless. You are dismissed.